course, in this room we share several of ideas here, but I would like to point out some um, principles and some idea that I would like to put on, I mean, on the table of the discussion. Uh, in this session, so, of course, transparency and trust are becoming competitiveness factor for data-driven economy. Um, I mean, the thing with, which is uh, problematic somehow is that data analytics is moving from the predictive to prescriptive, so to making decisions, sometimes instead of humans, so, I mean, uh, automatic decision making, which is more problematic issue. Um, so we need tools and we need to reduce uh, this information asymmetry between the producer of digital services, most of the time based on data management and analytics, and um, reducing this asymmetry between uh, digital service pro producer and digital service consumer, whatever he is, uh, a citizen or industry or government. I mean, in this regard, uh, most of the time we used to talk about privacy, privacy and uh, uh, personal data. In fact, it's not only about, I mean, at least in my opinion, it's not only a matter of um, personal data, but it should be about all data because once we are talking, I mean, sensitive data, uh, I mean, in the broader and, and data, that's it. I mean, um, in the case of talking about B2C, B2C, I mean, wh where the citizen is involved, then we can talk about civil rights, freedom, etc. Uh, but when the consumer is industry, we can talk about competition, which is fair or not. Um, when uh, government are client of such uh, services, we can also talk about sovereignty when there is no transparency. So transparency and ethics um, are very important at different levels, in fact, and not only at the uh, citizen point of view. Uh, so, of course, um, you are all aware of, uh, I mean, of the fact that we have uh, plenty of challenges. Um, also because uh, we used to think that, okay, I mean, algorithm, uh, they are automated process, etc. But um, the point is that algorithms are also in encapsulated opinions. How and why? I mean, at least when we consider decision parameters, learning data. So, I mean, there is the, the, um, I mean, the persons who conceive the algorithm also make choices when they make the conception of the algorithm. So, somehow there are encapsulated opinions in algorithm also. So, um, that's why when we talk about governance of um, algorithmic systems, most of the time we talk about governance of algorithm, but we don't talk so much about governance of data or, or we talk about each of them separately, which is, from my point of view, totally wrong and not efficient. I mean, mostly not efficient. And uh, of course, um, with regards to this point, if we look to the machine learning uh, algorithm, plenty of libraries are open source today, even from the GAFAM, uh, I mean, products, they are open source. They are available. I mean, you can use them, but not data. Data are not shared. So if we need to think about how to deal with transparency, uh, most of the time we talk about algorithm. In fact, we need to talk about transparency of algorithm and data. So one of the um, perspective to maybe to act in this direction is, I mean, of course, uh, from the academia point of view, there are initiative uh, and, and uh, um, early results uh, toward implementing the pr transparency by design. That means including fairness, equity, and loyalty, and also neutrality in the design um, stage. For instance, um, equity by design in um, uh, supervised machine learning, uh, we can identify uh, attributes who are uh, discriminative, and uh, instead of removing these um, descriptors, 
In fact, we need to identify them and to um, let them less influence the final decision. I mean, uh, discard them or ignore, ignoring the um, uh, discriminative uh, attributes is not the solution because the other ones we can reconstruct the discriminative, um, uh, I mean, variables. Yeah, um, yeah, in fact, also ethics is different from responsible. I mean, we can also discuss about this since we have some examples about to illustrate these um, differences between ethical and responsible. So plenty of challenges, in fact. Since we are dealing with the complex concepts and sometimes not always um, we cannot make them objective, sometimes they are subjective, uh, because they are dependent from cultural context, from law, which is different from country to another. Um, I mean, there are also the awareness of how algorithms are working. Plenty of examples in this regard. For instance, credit scoring or recommender system for credit scoring, for instance, the uh, FICO score. Uh, there are people who know how it works. And in fact, they keep traces exactly um, how uh, the FICO score will finally infer that they are really, um, I mean, good person from the uh, uh, financial point of view. So um, in fact, we have a, somehow a difference between people who are aware of algorithm is working and people who are not. So this is uh, an issue, in fact. So yeah, the, the idea is to really discuss all of us with our uh, also um, panelists what kind of effort we need to do and from which perspective. So here are some thoughts and also some, uh, in fact, um, way of working. Uh, at least we take this choice in, uh, in, um, from France perspective. I will uh, talk about two initiatives just before letting the floor to our panelists. So what we uh, understand and uh, what we are working, in fact, right now is to uh, provide this explanation and make more pedagogy about these uh, concepts to uh, uh, raise the awareness through use cases. And when I talk about this, it's not uh, talking about general public, but sometimes even within the scientist community, I mean, there are also other scientists in other disciplines saying, okay, uh, what are you talking about? I mean, it's only about certification and verification of uh, software and um, just to check whether there is a bug or not, and that's it. Of course not. I mean, we can have a software with no bug, but uh, that doesn't mean it is not uh, loyal. I mean, it's loyal or transparent or fair, etc., etc. So there are different properties that are included, I mean, in there. Uh, but also we believe that interdisciplinary co-conception of solution is key, but also international collaboration, at least joint uh, minimum co-definition of fairness with regards maybe to, to category use cases of fairness, of equity, of loyalty, and um, we believe there are two ways of um, doing things. First, through reverse engineering for making things auditable, but also building transparent by design tools and algorithm. So um, from the, at the French level, uh, we are building now, and we have this um, scientific platform called Transalgo under production. Now it's not open yet. And in fact, it is to support the law for digital republic, uh, which installed the, the right of the explainability of al algorithmic decision of public services. So uh, within this effort, of course, uh, um, the um, French Digital Council is partner and uh, contributor. We work together in this regard but also some um, regulation authority who are um, 
uh, I mean, uh, involved, like uh, DEG CCRF, which could be uh, equivalent to FTC. Um, besides, of course, academia, industry, and association. So it's more wide, um, uh, I mean, targeting um, public here for, tra uh, for transfer grade initiative. Uh, yeah, I mean, research center for information, report, publication, software, but also control data sets, testing protocols, awareness rising through workshop and MOOCs, best practice recommendation and sharing, and of course, research and development program. Uh, we are, I mean, in the uh, stage of building up working groups um, about auditability of uh, recommendation, ranking, Etc., but also explainability, robustness, and bias of machine learning, uh, reproducibility. I mean, there is a, a big and a huge issue there. Uh, another one about privacy, um, data usage control, and information flow monitoring. And also, this effort about building tools, transparent and, uh, uh, I mean, um, auditable, maybe responsible by design. Another academic effort that we are building up uh, is Dataya Institute, which stands for uh, Data Science, Intelligence, and Society. We have four uh, interdisciplinary uh, and uh, overreaching challenges. And um, I mean, besides, uh, oops, besides, okay, the pointer, maybe not. Yeah, besides uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence from data to knowledge, from data to decision, um, uh, transparency and trust is one over four priority here. Um, we have also scientific and disciplinary foundation, data science, management economy, social science, and legal science, with, of course, uh, plenty of application domain, but it will depend on, in fact, availability of data to uh, really make this happen. We, ca we cannot start a research topic without the availability of data with regards to this, I mean, to each problem. So it's a eight-year program with uh, 14 academic institutions in France. Okay, so this is to um, make some inputs to introduce our uh, uh, panel and then our um, keynotes will have a a positioning from their perspective, from their experience, and then we'll have a question, I mean, uh, together with you, the Q&A. Hi, my name is Ilaria. I work at MIT, the Internet Policy Research Institute. With, uh, together with Danny Weitzner, we lead the efforts in privacy and HCI. So um, I'm going to talk about different studies that we've done about uh, um, transparencies and the kind of things that the results that we found out. I'll be going very quickly. So at the end, I will publish a list of papers. So if you're interested, you can look at the details there, or you can ask questions. So the first thing that we look at was uh, if transparency actually could, um, make this, could help people make different choices. And we focused on the mobile space. So we looked at um, kind of uh, if people could actually identify the type of access of mobile devices. Uh, from, from apps, so will they actually make a different uh, decision? So we created a study that basically uh, people had to pick uh, an app uh, based on uh, permission information between two sets of apps. Uh, and then we improved the transparency mechanism of the Google Play as it was uh, back in 2014 to see if transparency actually will lead people to make different choices. So basically what uh, um, we saw, and I'm sorry, but there is part of the presentation that is missing, I just realized. So we basically had, um, hold on a second, because I wanted to show the, here. Uh, that's why, uh, can I ask the lady to come down and actually bring these slides up because that was the first slides. Um, like we start from the middle, that's what I realized, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, I am jet lag, but not just jet lag, okay. 
Okay, so yes, the main topic of the presentation is can uh, providing or improving data transparency actually affect people's choices? So we wanted to improve transparency and basically see whether or not this will make any sense in the mobile space. So if we gave people the ability to identify the type of permissions on apps, will people actually make different choices? So we used the Google Play interface and we basically made one small changes. We basically ask people to focus their attention on the permission that had access to their personal data. And then we provide a numeric value just to tell them this app actually has three permission that have access to your personal data and have the ability to send it because there was the internet permission on. Now this didn't mean that the apps will actually send their data and we debrief all the participants to basically understand that this will not mean that there was malicious intent from the apps. Then basically what we did is we created a study with various factors that basically will ask people uh, which apps will you choose between app one and app two just based on the permission information. So we didn't have any names or anything else that we could bias them. So uh, if we gave them and identified the access, what would people choose? So for the conventional interface, the one that Google Play was using at the time in 2014, people actually focused on fewer permission, which you can't read. So at the end, the people had to choose which apps they will um, actually choose and then give us a motivation. And the motivation was either coded between four different uh, um, uh, motivation, which one is the first one is fewer permission or fewer permissions that have access to your personal data, certain kind of permission and so on. And basically in the conventional interface, people actually focused on length. So they tended to choose the apps with less permission. And they basically said that that was the app that they would choose because of that reason. When we gave them the conventional, the improved interface, which was just a little change, so we highlighted the permission and we gave them a score, then people started to make different choices. So they cared about the permission that had less access to their personal data. So, and this was the same people, they rated the same apps, we asked them to think about the permission and to give them and then at the end we debriefed them. This was a lab study, so this was just based on permission. We wanted to see if the change could happen. And there was other research in the area that has shown that if you actually show them this kind of information to people, they will make different choices. So this was just a, a revalidation of previous research focused on the app interface. And we were particularly interested about the length, because if people were looking at the, the permission, what actually was the things that they were using commonly. So basically what we did was say, okay, we did this in the lab, but now we should really go and do it in the wild to see whether or not people will make different choices, especially based on the apps that they use on their phone. So basically we designed with one of my um, collaborator, Fu Ming Shi, who's now at Oracle, um, uh, a study in the wild that we look at, uh, we only focused on location because we wanted to have that one factor uh, about data because we didn't want it to uh, deal with multiple time of data. But then we looked at the different apps that people were using on the phone. So we use contextualized data and the type of purposes that people use to actually ask people whether or not they will want to share that location with that particular app that we know that they've been using for a specific purpose. And we created seven type different purposes that they were explained to the users that they varied between uh, no purpose whatsoever, so the field was left blank, to like just a non-descriptory one, just because we wanted to collect your data, to um, five uh, additional purposes that they varied from being beneficial to the users, which is for testing purpose, to give you a, a better experience for ad providers, or for the company to make money, or for the company to actually sell your data to data brokers. So people had to choose and we created a factorial design that was in the wild and people had to answer several questions throughout the day. What we found out? We found out that people basically shared the most when no information was shared. So when the name of the app or the purpose was shown. So exactly what happens now. That's why people share a lot of data. As soon as we had even a small uh, self-indication that something was happening, so we had either the name of the, the app or like just because uh, uh, we are collecting your data, then people started to share less. So their willingness to share even with the apps started to decrease. Then when we gave all the name of the app, they basically said uh, this is the app and depending again on the apps that they were using, so these are not like fake apps. These are apps that they're actually using on their phone. And we had, if you looked at our paper, you can see that we actually divided from usage. So we had apps that they frequently use to apps that they don't frequently use to see if the frequency of use or the emotional 
attachment or the usage actually had an effect, and it didn't. So it's basically when we show them the apps, people are willing to share less. Then we actually looked at purposes. So if we look at the different kind of purpose, and this when the app wasn't shown, we basically looked at purpose had one of the greatest effect. So people only want to share when it's beneficial to them. So when the app is actually either doing it for testing purposes or to provide even a better experience for ad, but if the company is making money, then people are less likely to, uh, to actually share. And they share the list when actually we show the app name or the purpose. So the more information you give to user, the less likely are they willing to share their data. Uh, now, I'm not saying that this will happen because at the end of the study, we ask participants, you are aware that you are sharing your location with Facebook? No, that never happens. So I was like, yes, you are. So we show it to them, I was like, okay, so will you remove the app? I don't think so. So I was like, okay, so for the entire study, you are not willing to share this information. We are telling that the app actually shares this information, but you're still not willing to remove it. But we said, okay, that's fine, it's your right. We just wanted to confirm. So while people feel very strongly about giving uh, uh, the, their data away, they are not willing to actually make compromises or to remove the app from the phone. So basically what we looked at, I said, okay, so purpose and apps, the name of the app actually has a lot of effect on users. So with some of my collaborators at Oxford, we said, okay, so there's been a lot of transparency models, so let's compare them and make up a new one, okay? We are a researcher, we try to create another one there. So basically we compared uh, the permission and app purpose that we had there, so we showed them people uh, uh, permission or apps, then we compared it to the data leaks, which is a CMU one that was uh, done by Rolly Craner at CMU, and then we created data controllers kind of uh, a visualization, which basically showed all the information about the data controllers that they were getting the information from the app. So if, for example, the app was sending it to third parties, we will, the, the, we will give the details about the name, the type of purpose, so if it was a marketing company, and actually where the company was based. So we were giving the location of the company. And then we decided, I was like, okay, so this information is very useful, but people actually make contextual information. So we decided to design an additional one to test, which is a personalized one, which basically aggregates all the data that you've given to companies and basically shows uh, the, all the details about the brokers, so the data controllers that they have your data or that you're sending it to, but it also gives you a personalized view. So if you've already given it to a company, it will say you've already given it to a company to uh, the, this app anyway, so will you give it again? So it was much more personalized uh, related to what's out there. And what we found out is that people's, when we actually compare, people had a lot of agreement and disagreement about which app they will choose. So we compared two apps and we, we did something similar to our first study with just all of the kind of models. So what we found out is that with the permission and purpose, it was very clear. People tend to share when they are less permission to access to their personal data or when the purpose is beneficial to them. Then when we, look, when we looked at the data leaks or our data controller or personalized data controllers, then there is a, a lot of variance. So people actually start making individual choices. And one of the things that was very interesting is that the certain heuristics were very different between participants. So what actually would have been a better choice for me was a worse choice for someone else. The example that I give was Google. Lots of people said that I, I trust Google, I want to give them their data, and I am there with them. I was like, I trust them, I have my spouse works for them, so they already have my data, I'm happy. Uh, other people are like, no, I don't trust Google, I don't trust Amazon, so I don't want their data to have. Even though they have this data, I don't want to continue giving it to them. So for me, it's out. I know that I've given them in the past, but I don't want to keep updating them. So what made a better choice, because I said they already have it, they already know, or as you say, I'm happy with it, made completely a, a completely different choice for other people. So basically what we have to understand is that all the transparency models are very difficult to build because there is no one size fits all. So even though we come up with the best transparency model for people, that might actually be make some people happy and other people unhappy because the choices are so very that some people will take so long to actually make different choices that it's, they are contextualized to their use that it will make their usage of devices very difficult. So one of the things that even though I've done all of these studies, I do truly believe the users cannot be tasked to make all the decisions. Even though they, they can, even though I give them the best transparency model, and even though there is a hundred questions that they have to answer every day and they were willing to do that, they cannot. 
I do believe that developers, lawyers, and policymakers have to work more closely to one another. And in the way that they have to work more closely to one another is not what we are doing today. So I am very lucky because being at MIT, one of my bosses, the, the head of our uh, initiative, he's a lawyer. So he's the one lawyer that is actually hired to lead one of the initiatives in a computer science department in America. Anyway, because he's a lawyer, we are actually running a course with George, uh, Georgetown in Washington. And we're basically running a course every spring with another professor in computer science, Hal Abelson, and two wonderful lawyers at Georgetown, two wonderful professors, um, Alvaro Boyoda and David Vladek. And basically, we are getting 12 students, legal students, uh, lawyers at Georgetown, and 12 computer scientists at MIT. And we have interactive lectures every week. And then we ask them to make uh, a, um, uh, we do a, a coursework. So we divide them in six different groups, so four each. Uh, or five groups, I can't remember how many they are, and we try to balance their interest. And we basically put them in the room, and they have to come up with a bill, a legislation, a white papers, and discuss, and we have weekly meeting with one of them. The reason that I'm saying that is because last year, one of my groups did a very interesting uh, project on personal assistant devices and their privacy motivations. And that was the first year that I was running the course um, with uh, Danny and uh, David and Alvaro, even though they had run it for two years before. And I had two very technical students on our side, and we had two lawyers on the other side. And David Vladek was the lawyer in charge on the other side. And I remember at the beginning of the meetings, they were looking at us like we were from another planet. And we were looking at them. They were like, OK, can we really talk to them? One of the very interesting example is that the lawyers really wanted to give control to users to make choices so using Alex. Okay? And they say, people can come in and basically click the button. I was like, OK, so everybody that comes to my house, I have an Alexa. We're going to make them click, and they have to give consent. And if they don't give consent, what, the device stops working? Yes. And we're like, no, it doesn't work. How can you make the device stop working? The device belongs to a person. I was like, OK, then can you make it so it recognized everybody's voice and fingerprints them all at once? So one of the students said, yes, we are very good computer scientists, but we don't have a magic wand yet. So we have to actually do the technology. There is computation. We cannot make a, le a legal registration that is feasible that says that all companies have to do that now. Maybe with when machine learning actually improves and it's close, we can do that. But we have to think about what's feasible and what not. So one of the things that we will do is we could go next to the device and basically get them my voice. And if my voice hasn't been recorded by the device before, so it's not a voice that recognizes itself, then maybe it won't record me. So that the background of the information is not recorded. Or you recorded the device when it's just closed, so you have a perimeter and the perimeter can be just so all of these solutions that came between lawyers and developers wouldn't have come the same way as if someone would have written a legislation and then the computer science had to do the technology or vice versa. So the, uh, the developers had to look at the legislation that had to be done and basically implement the technology. The fact that they have to work at the same time and actually have that kind of relationship, it's very important. And this is not a technologist that a lawyer that understand technology. This has to be a computer science that has to be able to speak with lawyer, and the lawyer that has to be able to talk to computer science. So while having both understanding it's very important, you also need to look at someone that actually will be implementing that technology. So both of the students now that we had last year, they both have, a, they both have very good industrial job. And they always will think the privacy, will think privacy or policy in the back of their mind, because we've actually taught them. So one of the things that we should do is to actually improve the courses, improve the way that privacy is taught to developers and to actually include that kind of level of policy so that we can actually make transparency as part of the developer process, not just the design process. So we don't have to access them. We actually have to make the system that has some sort of understanding from lawyers, from, from developers, and from users from the beginning. I think that's it. And these are the references. I'm sorry that they are, uh, it's a bit uh, uh, wavy, but as you say, if you go to my page at MIT or our initiative, you'll find all of these references. Thank you very much, Ilaria. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Luke Huan. I'm a program director working for National Science Foundation uh, in US. I also, um, at the same time, work as a professor working at the University of Kansas. Um, 
So today I was going to talk about a concept I call it modeling transparency. So I will explain. Um, I will I will talk about our research progress on that. So although I work for National Science Foundation, I, I'm actually I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our programs. But whatever I said um, is my own opinion. Doesn't represent the foundation. So. Um, Noza and our previous speaker, they set up the stage very well so I can skip some of my slides. So basically what we notice that um, data science is uh, um, heavily integrated into the US national priorities related to many aspects. Um, last year, the National Science Foundation director, Frances Condova, she published a paper in Science talk about the uh, NS big research ideas talk about the long-term investment plan from National Science Foundation. There are six big ideas, then uh, harnessing the data revolution is one of them. When we look at the harnessing data revolution, we look at many different aspects related to basic research, related to um, education, related to infrastructure. So NSF is uh, working on all, all of these aspects. So if we think about deep, um, now we like, let's zoom in a little bit. Let's think about deep learning. Many different people have different aspects of deep learning. Um, society think about it is, is a threat to the society. Robots is going to kill people. Uh, mathematicians and statisticians are always challenge computer scientists saying, uh, we, have, we have been doing that for many, many years. What's new here? As a computer scientist, I'm thinking myself of solving the most complicated problem in the world. At the end of the day, my student basically, uh, he's doing to load the package and apply the data. So um, one particular challenge about why the application of deep learning is that what's really going on behind the algorithm. So I'm going to talk a little bit on, on that. Uh, the, uh, one thing I want to mention is that um, this uh, problem get uh, widely recognized. In US, uh, uh, White House released uh, two white papers last year. Uh, one is a national AI research and development strategy plan. Another one is preparing future of AI. So both uh, reports, uh, um, there's a lot of information inside those reports, but the one thing get a uh, cross-referenced by these two reports are uh, the safety side of data science. So the basically, the safety side is, it contains a wide range of uh, concepts. It's related to uh, transparency, related to interpretability, related to accountability, related to uh, security, and many different things. So um, uh, early, early this year, uh, U.S. Academy of Science uh, uh, has a, had a joint workshop with the British Royal Society on the frontier of machine learning. Richard Burr from uh, UPenn presented a case study where he argued that he showed a case study that in the crime, crime justice, if there's three things, accuracy, transparency, and fairness, um, there's no way you can achieve the highest number on the three aspects. So you have to perform a trade-off. And so he argued this is more than uh, technical challenges. Also, this must be a policy and a legal aspect in, in trying to trade off or balance the accuracy, transparency, and fairness. And uh, Karen Yoon from Cambridge even pushed the concept to the next level. So uh, we have uh, uh, limited time, so I won't go to the details of this discussion. All this information are publicly available. Uh, you don't need me to talk about G uh, GDPR. We already have wonderful speakers, uh, a set of speakers talk about that. I want to give you a very simple, quick uh, case study. Um, so Eric Loomis, uh, a citizen in Wisconsin, um, early this year was sentenced to six years in prison. And it, during this sentencing process, the judge admit that the judge used the information fri from a private company. That the company basically take all the information from the, the defendant, uh, then produce a numerical score from one to 10, um, talking about how likely the person will recommit the crime after the, after the, 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 the sentence. So the judge actually used that information to decide how long 
he will put the defendant behind the bar. The defendant uh, lawyer challenged the, the thing because first it's a private company. Uh, they don't know how do they train their model. They don't even have access to the, to the model. They only have access to the result. They have no access to the data that they used to train the model. So they have nothing. They know nothing. They only know the final result. They don't know the data. They don't know how do they train the algorithm, uh, which algorithm they use to train the model. They don't have access to the model. They don't have, uh, they don't know how they validate the model. But the, the, magically, there's a number from one to 10. So the, the, the lawyer bring the case to the Superior Court of uh, a State of Wisconsin. Unfortunately, um, the Superior Court uh, denied to hear in the case. Uh, I think they made a mistake. I think those cases, we're going to see more such cases when we see more, um, when we see more algorithmic uh, decisions made for individuals. Um, so if we think about, now I'm going to talk a little bit about my own research on transparency and interpretability. If we think about these two concepts, it's actually uh, pretty complicated. It's very subjective. Uh, it's time dependent, as Noda said. Um, it's context dependent. Um, it's not just a single concept. It's, it could be defined in, at many different levels. Um, so, so we, at this year's uh, um, SQL KDD, we have a tutorial talk about safe data analytics. So if you want a tr full treatment, um, feel free to check out our slides or presentation there. So um, in the rest of few slides, um, I'm going to talk about a paper we published at KDD or called Constructivism Learning. Um, I, hope, I hope that will shed some light about the technical discussion about what is transparency, what is algorithmic transparency and algorithmic interpretability. The overall concept is modeling transparency. So the, the basically, once, the, once you produce a model, um, you can always, I, I believe you can always interpret it. You can, you can use some approximation, you can derive some rules based on the model. But I, my argument is that if, you, if we think about the transparency or interpretability, we have to look at the whole process. We, sh we should start from data, data collection, how this data are collected, how, what are the type of pre-processing are involved. And then you think about how do you derive the model, uh, how do you, um, what it mean to the end user, you should involve expert and you should involve data scientist. Um, this, of course, we are not the only group doing that. That's, many groups are working on that from uh, different institutes. So, um, so the key, the, the, the key thesis, the, the key point in our investigation is something called the human constructivism learning. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a philosophical view about how human learns. It's a very high level, very simple. Let me give you a very simple case. So the, basically the human constructivism learning theory saying human learns by interacting with the external world. We learn by our experience. Using two basic operations. One is called assimilation, one is called accommodation. So what is, what is assimilation? Let's say, um, let's say we have a, three year or five year kid and that person already knows something about dog. So if we see a picture of a slightly different dog and then that person are going to use that to update her perception, her knowledge about dog and that's called assimilation. So you basically, you, you have something you, you're familiar with before, slightly different and we can continue the process until this point. So what is this one? It's a wolf. It's a wolf. And a human has this high level intelligence. We are not going to put the, put the wolf image into the dog category. We realize that there's something new. So in machine learning perspective, we re realize that there's a new learning task in our, in our data set. Um, so that's called accommodation. And if, uh, so, the rest of the slide, few slides are very technical. So basically, once we reach this point, for people working in the basic non-parametrics, realize that, hey, this is a connection between the human constructivism learning to uh, basic, basic non-parametrics called the Dirichlet process mixture model. It's basically, you can use exactly the mathematical model to describe the human learning, the constructivism learning I just described. Of course, you know, if you want to do that, the, basically the idea is that, you, it's, a, it's online learning. 
It's a life, lifelong learning. You try, the data always come in. You're trying to decide what's exactly the, the learning tasks in the data set. So you see a bunch of dots, you see a picture of wolf. Then human has this capability to realize that, oh, this is a new learning task. And we want machine learning to have that capability. And we call that transparency because machine learning be able to recognize this new learning task. And the machine learning algorithm has that uh, part equivalent to human, uh, human learning. Um, so we have a particular way to implement that. And what I show here is that we run on few data set. We show that uh, the performance is not too bad. And it, so in this way, uh, here I showed you a, a synthetic data set with two tasks. And then um, the three figures above that 2D synthetic case. One is showing the, uh, using decision tree, showing number of trees. One is using support vector machine, showing number of support vectors. A third one, you see a jump. That's, that's using our algorithm to, to identify number of tasks in the data set. So if you use a decision tree or, or use a random forest or support vector machine, um, the algorithm works very well, but it doesn't tell you how many tasks, how many, what's the true number of tasks in your data set, and our algorithm is able to do that. And you can make the, the test case more complicated, and every time we'll be able to, to recognize that. So I'm doing a quick wrap up. So, so the basically, interpretability and the transparency are very important in the machine learning, in, in, in model construction, algorithmic uh, decision. And based on this human constructive some learning, we use the Bayesian non-parametrics, modified Bayesian non-parametrics, so that we'll be able to recognize what are the true number of learning tasks in the data set. And we believe that that improves the transparency and the interpretability. Okay, so um, with the next, in the next few, slide, a few minutes, I'm, I'm going to just uh, quickly introduce um, uh, NSF and uh, what are the related programs related to data science. So uh, National Science Foundation is, uh, is uh, created by the US, con US Congress, uh, mandated to, to, the mission is to do support basic research, education, and also infrastructure. Um, so we work in the, for the information, the computer science, uh, there's a directory called the Computer and the Information Science and Engineering. Um, the budget in 2016, is about $1 billion. Um, one thing about the NSF is that we don't do research. We send out grants. So every dollar coming to NSF, we send out 93 cents. We don't, we don't do our own, we don't do in-house research. Um, so in 2016, uh, uh, science within NSF received about 8,000 uh, proposals. And uh, uh, we something we formed a panel discussion. So we fly, we will fly the expert from the uh, cross the nation come to Washington D.C. to discuss those proposals. Very similar to uh, what what we see yesterday about the six funded proposals. So we we issued about two thousand awards and uh, um, eighteen thousand people get uh, supported. Uh, in U.S. nationwide, if you look at the basic research in computer science, NSF um, provide eighty two percent across all fund federal funding agencies, so the including NIH, including DARPA, including the uh, De Department of Congress and Department of Edu uh, Education and other things. So um, science, within science we have three divisions and one office. So uh, the highly related ones, the inform information and the intelligent systems, that's where I work for. Uh, basically we care about the data, intelligence, and um, the, the human technology interface. So specifically, there are uh, two programs, two regular programs that, that we support, big data and data science. One is called the big data, uh, there's a big data research and development. So, um, so, the, so in that big data program, we support foundations and innovative applications. And this year, I think uh, we, we are going to emphasize a list of uh, uh, highly uh, high priority areas. And I believe, personally, I believe transparency and interpretability is a very important part of that discussion. And another part of the program is called uh, 
the big data regional innovation hubs and spokes. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'll spend another five seconds to just quickly go through that. So that basically, we encourage interactions between academia and the industry so that both interdisciplinary research and provide a greater education program for the students. So I'm going to wrap up here, and uh, um, I won't go through the, the introduction. Uh, basically, uh, I won't go through the conclusion. Basically, the transparency and interpretability is very important before the wide application of AI. So it's a very timely topic. Uh, if you don't get the questions, um, that's my web page. With that, I conclude my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Morning, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Really, I welcome the invitation of DTL and uh, present uh, our work here today. We're going to give you a slightly different perspective from the over presentations because we're both policymakers. So my name is Lofred Mazou, and this is my colleague Judith Herzog from French Digital Council. And uh, I want you guys for the next ten minutes really like put yourself in the feet of policymakers, and I want you and I, and I want you guys like to consider the following question. Uh, we, uh, we think about transparency and accountability through basically the biggest tech companies out there. So our work is basically on online platforms accountability, and that's why it's a kind of different perspective here. We really think uh, uh, fourthly and evilly about the liabilities and responsibilities of the biggest market, market actors out there when it comes to data, pro data processing technologies. And I want you guys like, to be part of this discussion. So first, we're going to quickly present you the our organization, because I don't think that everyone here knows the French Digital Council. And then we're going to dive directly into the challenges that we face as policymakers on this area. And finally, the kind of the policy responses that we try to uh, put together to address these issues. Okay. So, so let's start with uh, with the French Digital Council. So it's basically uh, um, an advisory commission with, uh, which mission is to produce digital policy recommendations for French government. So we're independent by status, but we're publicly funded, and we uh, address any topics related to the impact of digital technologies on society, from the future of health, education, uh, algorithmic transparency, and, and so forth. What is interesting with our organization is it's really like a, a diverse organization, you know, bringing together experts in digital technologies from across the spectrum. So some of them are coming from the economics uh, field, so the entrepreneurs, uh, business people, um, you know, uh, senior executive in top, in top companies. So that's one third. The other third is coming from civil society organizations because this should be like a really global discussion because the impact of digital technologies uh, is so important that every like part of society should be involved in the design of the uh, policy responses. All the names are online, and the, so the last third is basically academics because these subjects are really uh, technical. We need like a lot of expertise around the table when it comes to address the policy challenges that they raise. And just to, to give you an update, we have just like um, we have just renewed our uh, college of members uh, yesterday. So these are like the new members, sorry, the new forty members. That you uh, that are going to you know, compose the the, um, the organization. So that's the first like you no know, part of the council, and there's another part which is basically the secretary general that Judith and I uh, are part of. So we're all policymakers uh, coming from different perspective, law, philosophy, uh, engineering, and so on. So let's dive now into the into the topic. So. When it comes to, to, uh, to online platforms, and, and I think that discussion is really important for, for us guys here again, because when you think about like transparency and accountability, we should be thinking a lot about the biggest actors who basically deploy these technologies and the impact that they have on society. That's really the approach that we try to add here. But when we, 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 we think about these issues, we're really like uh, stumbling upon three main uh, shortcomings of our current regulatory framework. So the discussion for us is, how do you upgrade this framework so as to address these shortcomings. So I'm going to present you quickly the shortcomings, and then my colleague Judith is going to present you the policy responses that we uh, try to bring together at the Council. So first one is like the speed of digital cycles. Uh, you know that, guys, but regulation is slow. So basically, we need first like to go out there, gather evidence. Uh, we need to bring up a case and you know, somehow figure out if you know, some harm has been done and how it has been, it has been done, and finally, ultimately, find the, the policy responses. Just one concrete example. Think about the Google antitrust case, uh, Google shopping antitrust case. It took nearly a decade for the commission from the start of a proper investigation to a sanction in Google IPL, so it's, it's still an ongoing process to sanction Google for its abuse of uh, um, uh, dominance position in the, in the um, 
shopping, mar shopping markets. And uh, well, 10 years is a, is a really long time in digital cycle. Well, in 10 years, that's another world you know, that just like uh, appeared. So, and all the actors that have been affected by the practice of Google and over market actors sometimes have been already ripped out of the market. So it's really, really too slow. Now the question becomes, how do you develop a more responsive policy framework that doesn't last 10 years, which is way too slow for the topic that we try to address? Second one is like the diversity of online platforms. Uh, think about it, like Uber is not Google, Facebook is not uh, um, Amazon and so forth. Ultimately, it comes to data processing as the previous keynote told us, right? But what is really challenging for policymakers is the fact that these platforms really blur the distinction between the classic categories on which you know, we built our framework. Uh, give an example on Amazon, like being a producer and being a consumer implies a lot of things in terms of regulation, but on these platforms, doesn't matter at all, right? So basically, we struggle to first define which kind of like object we're interacting with and how we can apply our current framework to address these issues. But the actors are so diverse. They start in one market, expand over markets, blur the distinction between the classic categories, operate globally. So it's really, it becomes really challenging for us to come up with a single solution. Then you think, well, you should have like a more like, you know, uh, tailored, you know, specific contextual approach, fair enough. But these platforms in themselves, individually, are so huge, so cross-cutting uh, uh, sectors that it becomes really challenging to come up with a policy response for any of them, actually. The last one is the opacity of online platforms. Well, there's not only an asymmetry of information between them and us, because they have the code, they have the money, but it's also like an asymmetry of power. So giving a concrete example, when it comes to algorithmic discrimination, for instance, which is like a growing discussion going on right now, it's really hard for regulators to really uh, demonstrate or assess the impacts of this, uh, of this like, data processing technologies out there. There was this like, controversies regarding uh, the advertising system of Google uh, in the US that basically discriminates um, basically women by like, providing like, less paying jobs, right? If, as a policymaker, we try like, to, from the outside, to uh, I guess that, like, uh, investigate this claim, it's going to be really, really challenging. And even though that Google, let's imagine that Google is want to cooperate with us, say, well, here's the code, go ahead. We're going to have resources internally to treat, uh, uh, to basically uh, run this kind of investigation. So these are the main challenges that we, we focus, uh, that we, uh, we face today, and now in terms of policy responses. Just quickly, um, so a principle of accountability, that's basically like the biggest like, uh, um, cornerstone of a new regulation now in France. Uh, so I'm going to give you like a minute to read basically like uh, the definition, but the, the whole idea here is basically like to constrain online platforms to be more fair, transparent, and accountable toward their users. So that's the kind of like the first basic like legal framework but the thing is, like, we struggle also with a lot of like, the, um, the effectiveness of a, of a legal framework. So yes, we have a bill out there, and the question becomes, how do you implement this bill? How do you make it effective? So that's the kind of thing that we, we try to do right now. And now I'm going to let my colleague Judith uh, continue on this. Um, I will maybe complement uh, what has already been said that it was very uh, instructive for us, so thank you for the opportunity to be here. <laughs> um, we, we, are, we can provide a testimony from how, as, as just Lofred said, uh, we, we entered into, into this topic, and we entered it through the subject of platforms, through the, sub subject, the topic of asymmetrical uh, power. So I will maybe uh, make a little uh, step, back. step back to walk you uh, through our, the main steps and then uh, explain our preliminary findings on the work we are running on right now. The first step for us was in 2013, the Council issued an opinion taking a first uh, strong st uh, stand for, uh, in favor of net neutrality. And uh, while saying this, it also said that uh, this principle will not be effective if you do not have uh, some kind of a complement on the service layer. Uh, this, this, this was said on the basis of the finding that there was a tendency to concentrate, to a concentrate on of power and uh, that we were going to, uh, to face uh, gatekeeping uh, effects and that we are going to need to monitor the respect of net neutrality on both layers. The, the, uh, and to uh, develop new uh, metrics to observe and report harms that are being done on net neutrality because of uh, practices of, uh, at the service layer. 
on this, and the, the second step was when uh, the, fr the, the, the government asked in, uh, us in, in 2014 to, issue, to, to express an opinion on Google's commitment in the Google Shopping case at the French level. They asked to uh, host a consultation between the plaintiffs uh, and, uh, Google, uh, and, and Google. The council chose not to, <laughs> to, to, uh, <laughs> to issue an opinion on this specific topic, but instead chose to, to, to take a more broad perspective on what was the controversy at this, at this, uh, at this, stage, this stage. We, we, we chose to, it, it, the council chose to consider the platforms as a global uh, shift in our productivity models, as all of Fred already described it. It blurs the line in uh, classical, category, classical categories that we use in law um, to just build our rules. And the uh, platforms are transversal disruptive, uh, the disruptors. And uh, this is a very strong um, uh, challenge, uh, like a giant stress test for our regulation. That's how we, we took it. And we, we called uh, for uh, like a global refit of uh, the, the design and the capacities of our regulatory uh, tools uh, just to be able to continue to do their job properly. Uh, one of our proposals was, uh, was to create uh, a body, prefer preferably European, at European level, that would be uh, in charge of mutualizing the, the, the resources to observe and uh, publicly evaluate the platforms and to produce metrics. The second step was interesting because the, the player, one, one of the things that struck us was that the, the players who came to us said uh, that they were, they were complaining because their, their, their business was going down, but they did not have the, the right uh, metrics to prove what was the causality, what should we observe, should we observe the design of the, of the page, but that, that has, it is difficult to integrate this in a, in a low uh, reasoning. So, um, then we, we started to broaden the scope of the things we, we are going to need to evaluate while looking at platforms' behavior. So net neutrality impact, uh, B2B uh, unfair practices. And after, uh, this, the third step was uh, when we uh, prefigurated the, the public consultation, the online public consultation that was run before uh, the government's own public consultation uh, prior to this uh, bill, the, French di the bill for the French digital, uh, digital public. And uh, in this opinion, uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, expression of uh, preoccupation from uh, individual contributors and representatives of the uh, uh, consumer association, civil rights, and etc. Et and this just kept uh, co confirm uh, our own uh, conclusion. We do not have the. Um, we have a strong demand from the, so from the society to get answers and guarantees that uh, platforms, platforms are not behaving uh, wrong. Uh, but we do not have the right design. We do not have, uh, uh, because you have a, a political layer that can express itself sometimes in the media to, to say, uh, you do not pay your tax, uh, you have a strong decision. And regulators, they cannot, uh, when they have the power to sanction, they cannot in the same time publicly shame someone. But still, we, we believe you, you need to create this, uh, this lever. This lever. Uh, of course, the reputational level uh, will have a differential impact uh, regarding if you are in a monopoly state or if there are a lot of uh, uh, alternatives. But uh, we, 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 so, so we, so we issued this, this third opinion. What we are doing from, uh, since a year is that we are uh, investigating how, uh, what are the prerequisites to build such a regulatory uh, design. I can, at, at this stage, uh, share three main findings. We need to uh, first uh, have a, a, a simple key of entry into the, 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 la the large, very large scope of topics that we need to investigate. For us, we chose to call it uh, accountability in a much more broad, broad, broad scale than only consumer rights. It, it needs to be, for us, uh, we understand it as a, a, as a transversal layer that you will need to enable each silo of law. You need to assess, for example, whether uh, platforms are, uh, or actors are uh, uh, implementing the data portability rights. You need to test whether uh, what they are saying in their uh, terms of services are understandable for the average people, and you need to, uh, to develop the means to, to evaluate this, because right now it is not done very uh, regularly. Uh, and you need to uh, assess whether uh, there are degree of openness to public scrutiny. 
And this for us would be a good lever uh, of uh, a reputational lever. It would be to first strategically build um, a, a partnership with the citizens, rebuild this in order to have not the public, place, the public uh, players, the public politicians uh, intermediating, uh, being an intermediate between the people and uh, what should be uh, evaluated. They, they should build infrastructure to let the people express what should be, what are their preoccupations. So I hear uh, it is interesting because the, the first presentation uh, was on the limits of asking the people to, uh, to, to decide themselves. It is uh, obvious. But, and, uh, but from a political side, there is a strategic need not to have the politician say uh, in the law, you, do not you cannot do this, 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 this. And if you are a strong player, you are the first able to develop the tools to say, OK, I'm compliant with this, 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 this. But everything that you didn't say, I didn't, I, I do not have to, uh, everything that the law does not precise, I do not have to respect. So you need tr uh, transversal principles, but also a dynamic uh, civil society to push and observe and, uh, and express uh, bad uh, behaviors. So that is our, that is our point. Um, and uh, to, to conclude, maybe I can share uh, like uh, two or three uh, very short examples of uh, the type of initiatives that we are, um, uh, because we, we've been uh, meeting with like uh, 150 people from since a year in the United States, in, the, in Europe and France. And uh, we have, we are able to synthesize their feedbacks uh, first. There are three needs that are not uh, being fulfilled right now, and it, it, it doesn't have to do only with the lawmaking. It has to do with investment, it has to do with uh, in project engineering and capacities that we need to develop and we do not have the design right now. Uh, the first would be if, if you need to address the, the wide public, you need to invest in, the, in the how you, do, you are doing this. Because, uh, for example, our first uh, hypothesis was to, be, to create a platform that would be open to the public to report its problem. But then we've met with uh, experts of design and, uh, and uh, experts of the field, uh, better than us, obviously, uh, that, that just told us that uh, it, it cannot work if you expect users to quit their navigation and to start to write down vocabularies that they do not have. It won't work. So you need something that maybe you... Uh, you we've been working with students from a French design school and asked them to, you know, to use uh, the materials that we produced. And they, 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 they chose to take the user, not in a siloed approach, as we would have the reflex to do. Consumer, business, and et cetera, et cetera. They, they, they advised us to, uh, to recommend a plugin for navigator, uh, uh, screenshot sharing, very more down-to-earth uh, practices. Uh, so, uh, and then we've been working with a French sociologist, uh, uh, Dominique Cardon at the Media Lab. I'm sorry, am I, uh, if, am I still have uh, time? Okay. Um, so we've been working with a French sociologist uh, to study how people are already sharing their, uh, relation, their, their reactions to how platforms are working. To how, uh, to, to, for example, uh, they, they found that there are already a lot of uh, people sharing in the social media uh, testimonies in a more humorous way, like why this, uh, why am I being uh, advertised uh, uh, Harry Potter underpants, stuff like this. But sometimes it's more interesting, but it's very uh, um, uh, dispersed. So you need to have the right uh, ears to gather these different sources and to share it with the right uh, academics or regulators for them to, to, to build on this. I have another, uh, the second testimony would be uh, when we've met uh, with um, academics from Columbia University, the Sunlight team, uh, who are working on a, a protocol to detect uh, ad targeting discrimination. And one of their conclusions is that you cannot, if I remember properly, you, you cannot rely on fake users to test and try to retro-engineer uh, uh, this, this kind of problem. So you need to rely maybe on real users. And that, then for us, it starts to be interesting because maybe this you cannot build, uh, uh, you know, every time a different... You need to mutualize the, the means to do that kind of, uh, of, of uh, protocols. So for us, it's, it's interesting. But when you ask to, the, to, the, to this, to, to this uh, academic, uh, how are you going to develop it? He, said, he just said that uh, uh, my currency is a research paper. I'm not a developer. I'm not a designer. So I need these capabilities. So um, I can maybe end on this. And 
say that uh, to do a little bit of ad advertisement, we are trying to list every kind of initiative that we find coming from academic sphere, but also from civil society, uh, because we detect uh, uh, a risk that uh, if the means to test uh, platforms behavior and algorithmic uh, problems is only um, uh, is prioritized through only academic uh, scope, not, not to diminish it, huh? but uh, <laughs> maybe there will be a, la a lack, a democratic problem because you need these capabilities to be also in the hand of uh, um, um, uh, people's right uh, advocates. Uh, and so if you have uh, 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 experience like this to, to, to share with us, we'd be very happy to promote them and continue to do this, uh, this work. Thank you. Thank you.